Okay, so I wanted to just to say a couple more words about these exponential operators. And as I said before, um, you know, the time evolution operator, I'm going to say, to follow the time, the evolution of a system in time under some Hamiltonian is, of course, an obvious application for chemistry and for physics. We want to do a lot of that. And so what we typically do there is we use the so-called Trotter-Suzuki product formula, which is if this has multiple terms in it, we decompose it into a product of terms and then divide by some uh, coefficient k and then basically implement this product of terms k times. Okay, so you can see that would give back the same thing. The issue is, so each one of these parentheses is regarded, uh, treated as a, a single trotter step and treating these as a product is an approximation because if these terms ha and h a prime do not commute with each other, then you've got correction terms that have to also be applied. So the idea is to make this time step as small as possible so that those non-commutation terms are as small as possible. And that's why we then have to have multiple, multiple steps k. So, so, okay, so I was going to then give you some examples of these ground state calculations. We already stepped ahead and looked at um, one from IBM with the um, hardware efficient ANSAT. This is, uh, this is just the, the simplest possible system, H2, and this is using a Jordan Wigner state. That was the circuit I showed you actually before from Claudino's paper. Um, that, that, so that's just the circuit you would get with Jordan Wigner. So the actual experiment that was done, I'll show you on the next slide, was done at Berkeley mm -hmm. in my colleague Ifan Sadifi's uh, lab. And they actually used the bravi kitayev transformation. Um, that was because they could take advantage of the SIP. So this Hamiltonian that you then get has a lot of symmetries in it. And they could, so this is a four qubit Hamiltonian, but they could take advantage of the symmetries to reduce this to a two qubit form. So I've only got two qubits here. And I have terms, uh, single qubit terms, Z1 and Z2. Then I have cross terms, Z1, Z2, X1, X2, and Y1, Y2. So that was in 2016. So this just, I wanted to show these just to give you some idea also for these small, Hamilton, small systems. So there are only two electrons here. Um, just how many terms in the Hamiltonian you would actually get and what they look like in this qubit representation. So this is, uh, okay, this was their implementation of the quantum phase estimation algorithm. So again, using this uh, bravi kitayev transformation. So what they have here is um, two qubits and an ancilla. So you need the ancilla for the, uh, actually two, two ancillas here for the, what is this? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure why there's only one qubit shown here, or maybe that is a two qubit state. But anyway, they, um, these two here are the ancillas, and you see this circuit divided into, first of all, preparation of the initial state, that are these gates here, here. And then uh, the next set here is the trotterization of, this is one uh, trotter step here, and so they're implementing then um, the, the controlled unitary with involving each of these terms in the Hamiltonian, a Z0 term, a Z1 term here, an X1, X0 term here, and a Y0, Y1 term here, okay, in a controlled manner. So each of these are different pulses, and then at the end, they have to have a, um, a rotation uh, to then make a measurement of the bits here. Okay, so this was the QPE, and I'm gonna show you, so this was a total of um, 51 single qubit gates and 14 two qubit gates. And just for comparison, this is a VQE circuit that they, the same group, did. This is a paper that compared these two. 
uh, approaches for H2. So same Hamiltonian, same, same encoding, Ravikan Kitaev encoding. And so now they, are, they don't have any controlled unitaries anymore because you've replaced in the VQE, you've replaced the uh, controlled unitaries of the quantum phase estimation by just preparing a state and measuring expectation value of the Hamiltonian elements. So they just have to prepare the state. So again, the initial state's here. And then they, this circuit here is preparing the ANSAT state. And they will then uh, measure. Uh, they make some ro rotations here to go into the right basis to be able to measure these different um, operators here, which contribute. So these are the six, one, two, three, four, five, six terms that contribute here in the Hamiltonian. OK. And then they do classical optimization to iterate on the parameters. Uh, this, this one has a parameter. And this is actually probably here the only free parameter, because this is C0. Yeah. So they had it's a very, very simple case, just one parameter. OK, so here's their results uh, from 2016. And their initial state was the UCCSD, but it, but it looks very, it's very, very simple in this case. Um, so, uh, so the exact energy is the black line underneath these curves here. The red line, the red dots, sorry, the red dots are, dots are from the variational quantum eigensolver. And the blue crosses here are from the quantum phase estimation. They called it phase estimation algorithm. OK, and you can see that there is really more noise on the phase estimation algorithm than there is in the um, variational quantum eigensolver. And that's not surprising because the variational quantum eigensolver only has one parameter. So it's not a hard optimization problem. And it's a very small system. So they can basically measure and measure and measure until they get the statistical error down. Yeah. Is there any intuition behind why it's doing so poorly in this one regime, but like for small bond angles, yeah. PA seems to be doing really well? Oh, yes. Yeah, this is harder. Yeah, H2 is that like it's harder. You stretch H2 you, you stretch. Harder. It's yeah. a stronger correlation. Yeah, there's a point here. It's two points. What? Where's the Coulson-Fisher point? Coulson, no, it's 1.2 angstroms. 1.2. So that's actually here. Okay, so that's It a, gets hard a, here, but then all around here, the, the I mean, the, the atoms are still feeling each other, the electrons and so on, so there's still some kind of weak bonding. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's still below the dissociation limit, but it's hard to get it right. right. What is your problem? Well, There's a point. There's a Fisher point when the unrestricted Hartree-Fock uh, and the restricted Hartree-Fock oh, okay. are different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So in the restricted Hartree-Fock, the electrons are both in the same orbital with different spins. And in the unrestricted, they can be in different orbitals. Right. So you have more freedom in the unrestricted. Okay. Okay, and this one we talked about before the break. This is from IBM. This is beryllium hydride. It's a slightly bigger um, system. Um, and yeah, so here, as we saw, they were getting results that are from optimization of this hardware efficient ansatz, where they don't really put any. They do start. Yeah, they actually start with the vacuum state. They don't even start with Hartree Fock. Uh, and they, yes, and, uh, and they get these black points here after optimization, um, which are in agreement with their, with their simulations, so theoretical simulations of the performance of their circuits if they add noise to the circuit. But this was, five, this was six, six years ago. This is a long time ago in this field. Oh, this is the last slide of this. OK, is there any questions on this? Because I will then, if not, I will move to the second set of slides. Can I ask a, wait, wait, a quick uh, question yes. on, the, on the graph with QPE? So it seems that some of the energy dots are going lower than the, uh, the variational there. energy. So it's, is it, it means that it's not variational. I mean, it's interesting. I think it's not variational. Yes, it's not variational. VQE, we always get yes, yes, yeah. That was another advantage of VQE. Yeah, QPE, you just have to have over. The only criterion is to have overlap, sufficient overlap with the ground state. But then you can approach it from any direction. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'll leave this one open. All right, so let's do this one. There we go. All right, so now we're going to talk about how we actually, what this, this is a big picture that I think you were asking about at the back, you know, so does this, why are we doing this? You know, does it actually, it's very interesting, obviously, it's very interesting to do, and there's a lot of fun stuff, we learn a lot of fun stuff along the way, but is there any possible benefit for quantum chemistry that can derive from this? So, so first of all, let's think about what do quantum chemists really want? They want many things. But right now, I'm just going to focus on uh, things very much restricted to electronic energies. And so they want to have a, a real, you know, a real fundamental uh, pillar of the entire field is to get ground state electronic energies as the nuclear coordinates vary, as I mentioned before. And this, of course, gives you information not just about stable molecules, but if you follow these ground states from some region of a minimum uh, over here, you know, over these barriers in between different minima, you learn about, um, you get transition states and you learn about reaction rates and, uh, and transition state energies. And so you get a lot of very, very valuable information for processes like catalysis, which are really very important in, in the world today. Um, we also are interested, uh, I mean, as a community in general, uh, quantum chemists want to get excited state electronic energies as the, uh, as the nuclear coordinates vary. And here's a, uh, an interesting example from uh, a biological system that I'm a bit familiar with, which is the, um, the rhodopsin isomerization. This is a rhodopsin molecule, which is important in our vision. And the primary step in vision is absorption of a photon uh, in the visible regime. And it takes rhodopsin up to an excited electronic state. And then there's a very fast transfer um, along some isomerization coordinate. And it's well known what isomerization coordinate this is. It's actually the rotation around a, a double bond um, in the rhodopsin molecule here. And that isomerization coordinate actually goes through a crossing of, a, of the ground electronic surface, which would actually, if there were no crossing, it would just go straight up here. And the excited state surface, which is here, comes down here. So the excited state surface, remember, is if I were to solve the electronic structure problem, the lowest in a finite basis, I would get my, the lowest energy state that I would get out of a, say, diagonalizing the Hamiltonian in basis would be my best estimate in that basis for the ground state. And the next one would be my best estimate for the excited state the next higher energy. So we can typically get excited states. Uh, but here we have this unusual situation where the electronic energy of two states coincides. And that means at that point, the nuclei are kind of schizophrenic. They don't know which surface are they really on. Uh, this is what's called a conical intersection. It's a region where the time scale of electronic motion and nuclear motion is actually similar. It breaks the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And we really have to consider the motion of all electrons and all nuclei together. This is a, one of the outstanding challenges of theoretical uh, chemistry today. Uh, so we have the so-called non-adiabatic effects. And these are very, very important, certainly in biological systems. Um, um, in order to make accurate predictions, certainly of something like this, but even around these transition states here, yeah, we're going over barriers. We need to know what the electron correlation is. So we need to know about this 5% energy that's, um, you know, you might think that it's not very important, but if we want to actually know how, whether a rate will proceed or not under certain conditions, we need to know that energy quite accurately. So that means we need to think about correlation in different terms. So we need to start thinking about it, like really, how much of it can we really get? So and typically in quantum chemistry, we uh, firstly, electronic correlation refers to everything that's not captured by Hartree-Fock. So the rest of it is, I mean, there is, a, there is a kind of correlation already in Hartree-Fock, 
there's the, statistic, the quantum statistical correlation of the anti, of the anti, um, the anti symmetrization of the wave function, but that's a, an intrinsic quantum uh, statistical correlation, so that's not regarded as the electronic correlation that's specific to individual molecules. Um, and then there's also the mean field, which is sort of an average type of correlation. But to distinguish those, which are both very generic um, forms of uh, correlation between electrons from the ones which are more molecule specific, we refer to everything else as the electronic correlation. And that, so we, you can think of, say, this is just schematic, but you could think of, well, there's some correction to this Hartree-Fock wave function, which contains all those correlation effects. And so those are important in all of these important systems here, bond breaking, transition metal systems, anything where there are sort of unpaired electrons, correlation is become super important, um, and so polyradical systems. And in some cases, one can say that there's, one can divide correlation into strong and weak. So strong correlation is, and these, there's, a very, this is, there's no sharp boundary between these, but generically speaking, we say that if we've got, say, a multi-radical system that there's an unpaired electron here and an unpaired electron maybe uh, two angstroms away on another um, atomic site or another, even another molecular site in a complex, we would see that we'd have to have multiple configurations of electrons. So in other words, here we would have a particular determinant or set of determinants that would describe excitations around these atoms. And over here, we would have different set of determinants and associated atomic orbitals that would describe motion of electrons around those atoms, but then they interact by Coulombic forces. But those are separate configurations, so, so they would be corresponding to separate Hartree-Fox states. So strong correlation is when we have uh, multiple cor configurations, so multiple Hartree-Fox states, necessary in order to have significant overlap with the ex exact state. So for a strong correlation, we would take our psi Hartree-Fock and we would add, if you like, on this axis, we would add another Hartree-Fock state, or maybe another three Hartree-Fock states, corresponding to the different, different reference states where that electron is, is primarily localized. And then, in addition to that, there's the weak correlation. It's just, so this is sometimes referred to as static correlation, because it sort of has to do with localization, spatial localization. And then there's the weak or dynamic correlation, you know, by contrast, which is basically always present um, in a system. So even if you have electrons uh, localized in one particular region, these are these small contributions from many, many, many higher line configurations. If you like, think of the coupled cluster operator, just adding more and more of those single, double, triple, quadruple, all the way up there, contributions, uh, all the way up to as number of excitations as the number of electrons you have. And all of these uh, contributions give you some corrections which take you closer to the energy of the exact state. So often, you know, often one can ignore the, um, the strong static correlation because, you know, if you, don't, if you only have one unpaired electron, then maybe you really don't even need to worry about what, the, what things are doing around that electron and not in other places. But if you have any of these systems, you have to start thinking about multiple configurations. And here is, so this is a holy grail, I think, for the field. Definitely not something solvable within five, ten years. Uh, but it's one of those biological systems that's really out there in terms of posing a challenge to our understanding. Right now, we have a reasonably good understanding of its structure, but not of the energetics. This is the oxygen evolving complex of um, the photosynthetic uh, system two. And this is responsible for green plants splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen in order to build sugars. So this is sort of the central core part of photosynthesis. After the light's been absorbed and after you've created electron hole pairs, then the energy, the, the electrons come down here. And then there's this sort of complex here of metal atoms, manganese, 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 manganese. And, um, and then oxygens in between here. And this complex of metal atoms here, uh, and they're manganese, they're transition metal atoms, they exist in multiple spin states. 
and the mechanism by which energy or excitonic energy, excited state energy is transferred between these is not very well understood today at all. And a lot of calculation, a lot of theories being done to understand even just the energy ordering, in particular the spin state ordering of the low-lying energies of this complex. So, yeah, and those low-lying sp electronic spin states, they determine the reactivity of the system. And that's really important for, for life. So this is a system that has strongly correlated states because it has these multiple, each of these transitions, each, you can think of every transition metal atom as having the capability of providing a radical, of having some unpaired electron on it. So you've got multiple ones of those. And then of course you also have the oxygens in here and the, all the surroundings here, also the calcium atom here. Um, you also have these weak correlations. You've even got also, it's possible that the in between here, not shown, are water molecules and sort of all the surrounding stuff, which, which will also affect the weak correlations. So this is, we would like to get some way towards at least understanding the spin state ordering. That would be actually a big step in understanding the functioning of oxygen, the oxygen evolving complex. But that's the holy grail. It's way down the future. And it's, I would say it's beyond the... Um, the Fimoco uh, ion molybdenum complex that was proposed some years ago as a sort of holy grail. Okay, so let's think about how does quantum, conventional quantum chemistry address this issue of correlations? Well, so we do have an exact solution, which is the full configuration interaction. That's when you add, so if you have a finite basis set and a finite number of electrons, you at a finite number, it may be very large, but it's a finite number of determinants that you could make. You can put electrons in to, uh, in accordance with the Pauli principle, you can put electrons into each of the uh, spin orbitals and you can, um, you can construct all possible within a, uh, determinants within a finite basis set. So the problem is that this exact solution, the, the number of the uh, determinants that you would get scales exponentially with the size n. So if you wanted to do such an exact solution, which is by constructing all of those possible determinants and then expressing your Hamiltonian in that basis set and then diagonalizing the matrix, um, you would find you're rapidly running out of options after about, what, 100 electrons? If you could even do 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I looked it up at one point, it's around 100 or something. So, so quantum chemistry as we know it today is all about solving approximate models of the Schrodinger equation. So this is exact, basically in a basis set. So instead one so, so constructs some approximate model and tries to solve that approximate model, model as precisely as possible. So typically also you would target energy gaps and exploit cancellation of errors that might be due to the fact that you're using an approximate model. And so typical approximate models involve uh, uh, the couple cluster or the, uh, or the, if you're, there's a wave function based approach or if you're using density functional, that's also a, an approximate model. Wave function methods uh, are nice if, we, if you're thinking about electron correlation because they typically allow you to systematically think about improving your description of electron correlation. Like, for instance, in the coupled cluster, you would add more and more excitations in a systematic way. And that's nice. The reference point, as we've discussed before, is the mean field, Hartree-Fock energy. And, okay, so here are the coupled cluster methods. So they are typically polynomial scaling in the basis set size. Um, so we mentioned, someone asked earlier about the, the classical. So this is, if you were to do coupled clusters, singles and doubles and triples and quadruples. Not that I think anybody has done this completely, right? Because you have to, the last two are perturbative, right? Well, very small. Very, yeah, you could probably do this to H2, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you don't, but you don't have four electrons. <laughs> yeah, so, but this is scaling order n to the 10 in time and order n to the 8 in storage. And my understanding from my colleagues is that the, this is really what kills you the storage. You need to store all of those integrals. And that is huge. So this is really what limits classical uh, quantum chemistry on the wave function side. 
Now, people are developing linear scaling approaches, but they aren't, so far, aren't very suitable for strong correlation. So, so the question is then, can quantum algorithms help us here? Well, so here's a, here's a perspective from the computer science uh, side, which is, so this is actually my former student, Brian O'Gorman, who made those other set of slides. And he and two um, uh, CS colleagues uh, showed a few, couple of years ago that the, if you wanted to consider this as a complete abstract theoretical problem, the, the question of the ground state evaluation of N nuclei, uh, capital N, or, sorry, M nuclei, little n electrons, and capital N spin orbitals without any restrictions on it. The worst case scenario is that it's so-called QMA complete, and QMA complete is very bad news for quantum computing because it's the analog of NP complete for classical. So if you know a little bit about classical complexity, NP complete is epitomized by the traveling salesman problem to which there's no known analytic solution. If you could solve it, then you can solve all other problems with the NP. And similarly with QMA, if you can solve that, you could solve everything else that's inside it. And what's inside it is this BQP, which is the complexity class bounded quantum polynomial. And that complexity class is where most of our quantum algorithms today sit. Okay, so, so this is very bad news in a sense for quantum computing, but it's worst case complexity. So uh, maybe we can find quantum advantage in some very special or important instances that so which, which would take us into this region here, to BQP, which is where we know that that's where we currently sit with our efforts to simulate, um, to, to use quantum computers to solve algorithms and simulations. So, okay. So if we go to back to the quantum phase estimation, so this actually is formally in this BQP complexity class. It's bounded polynomial, or quantum polynomial. Um, so that means, okay, so this is the actual complexity uh, analytic, uh, the asymptotic cost. So what this is, the cost is at most, so there would be a big O here. So the cost goes as one over the overlap. So that's what I mentioned before, this. So that's one over S squared. And then there's a polynomial in the basis size, N. So that's good. That puts us in the QP. And this is polynomial in the one over the um, accuracy that we want. And this is all bounded from above, so that's definitely in BQP. So this is good news. If we can make sure that our um, ground state electronic structure problem fits into this category. So if we can reduce the scaling to that for a specific instance, that would be good. So last year, there's a group of people in the field who tested, um, who were interested in this problem, whether there's, what, what actually is the promise of quantum algorithms for quantum chemistry. And they tested classical methods for a number of ansatzer. Um, and these were all single reference ansatzer, namely one Hartree-Fock state. And they found that they actually got similar scaling for the classical methods. They got a similar scaling to this. So in other words, they didn't get an exponential uh, so, so, yeah, so this is classical. So the expectation was if there was a big advantage of quantum computing for this problem, that the quantum compute, the classical methods would have been then scaling exponentially larger than this. Okay, so that there would be an exponential gap between a classical calculation and a quantum calculation. So they found that, well, while indeed this is, this is nice for a quantum phase estimation, they found that, oh, but a lot of the classical methods also give this same scaling. So back to your question, why, why, do we just, why don't we just use those classical methods? So they, and this is empirical. So there's no empirical evidence here for quantum advantage when using single reference states. So that's, if you go and look at that paper, it doesn't say that, but it's there. Uh, single reference states are good for weak correlations. If you have strong correlations, they really will not, they're not very gent, they're not working very well. I have a question. Yes. Um, so the um, worst case is QMA complete, 
Worst case means yes. that the worst you would need model of a molecule. Full FCF, like yeah. full uh, like FI, full configuration interaction. Well, classically, you would need full configuration, and the quantum leak cannot help you right. because yeah. it's in this complexity class that's Still that's, that's very that's the analog of FCI, if you like, for for a quantum computer. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, so what we have to do then, we have to look is, well, where, where does quantum chemistry have a problem? Where does conventional quantum chemistry? In other words, where does it actually completely fail? Okay, so that study was a little bit um, worrying for people, but it was only single reference, so, which was only really weak correlations. So quantum chemistry has problems obtaining accurate energies for systems with both strong and weak correlations. So you can get around that, though. You can, so this is what I'm going to tell you about a little bit more, which is that there is uh, an approach that allows polynomial cost for systems with strong and weak electron correlations. So that's quantum Lie polynomial. That's fine. That was the same as in BQP. But in addition, if you compare with the classical, there's an exponential gain over a corresponding the corresponding classical solver. In fact, the corresponding, the really corresponding classical solver is impossible to scale. Uh, so I'll say more about that in a minute. And the closest possible uh, classical analog also is exponentially uh, more expensive. So, and this, this approach is basically so, uh, based on a system that, uh, an approach which is not very widely used in quantum chemistry, which is using non-orthogonal quantum states as your basis, rather than orthogonal quantum states. Um, but you know, as you get, you get out here very good energies, and you can use this as a further ansatz for QPE to get even more accurate results. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this and why, 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 where this is coming from. OK, so classical methods for correlations. So there's uh, methods where you would take an active space and like here, there's so these energy levels here, and you would solve the exact problem in this selected orbital subspace. Like you might say that in these three levels down here, those electrons are frozen. They're not going to be excited up into this space here. And I'm really interested in the details of the energies in this band here. So I just want to solve the problem exactly in this, um, in this energy regime. So that corresponds to a selected orbital subspace. And then there are these other methods, which are non-orthogonal methods, uh, configuration interaction methods, where one takes, so what's shown here are three configurations. So there's a set of energy levels here, a set of energy levels here, and a set of energy levels here. They can be the same or they could be different. Um, but we have here um, eight electrons. And here they're distributed over this set of levels. Here they're distributed over the brown set of levels, and they have different orderings. And here, they're distributed over this blue set of levels. And again, there's different orderings. So these are different configurations. Um, and there would be a Hartree-Fock state for this configuration, a Hartree-Fock state for that configuration, and a Hartree-Fock state for that configuration. And each of these configurations might describe the electronic um, structure around where the excitation or the, this, this one looks like an excitation was centered around a particular group of orbitals over here, whereas this one might be the ground state where the excitation, there is really no excitation, and this one might have a, a local excitation in some other region in the molecule. Okay. So yes. is the NOCR method, uh, does it just introduce uh, more kind of a variation of parameters by the orbital changes for different things, so that it might get uh, a uh, maybe a lower energy if the same configuration is used that's the, uh, the case that the same configuration it, used in the cast. It gives you more flexibility. You'll see, you'll see it, how. Uh, will the energy be lower than the cost? Maybe it can be. It can be. You have, to choose the, you have to choose the configurations correctly. So you need this method benefits from having some chemical insight into relevant configurations. Yeah, so how... So you may also have the CAS method may become much larger. If you have, um, if you have correlations between re regions that are quite far apart, your CAS uh, subspace may become very large 
in which case it may be simpler to use this. So that answer is simpler to use it by adding the freedom of the uh, orbital orbital rotations by uh, maybe the different kind of the molecular orbitals. Yeah. Yeah, mathematically that's what you do, but you really would want to have some insight into the configurations that you're putting in. Yes. Uh, so, is, is there any kind of the maybe chemical insights uh, uh, utilized uh, when you choose the molecular orbital yes. coefficients? Uh, well, or it just, uh, no, you would, uh, the chemical insight would be into which reference states you're using. Oh, so just the configurations so, and uh, we variationally optimize all of the... Uh, well, you, you, I'll tell you what we do. Okay, you'll see. You'll see what you do. You, you have to, first of all, the starting point is to create Hartree-Fox state for each of these reference states. Mm. Okay? Okay. okay. What is the advantage of uh, the states being non-orthogonal here? You'll see. <laughs> okay. So this is how it works. So given an atomic orbital basis, you, so I haven't really talked about that, but that's sort of underneath everything. Um, given atomic orbital basis, you comport, compute a set of Hartree-Fock molecular solutions, and they're typically different spin states, reflecting different configurations, okay? So if we have these, you know, multiple radicals uh, that can be in different spin states. So, so here's the, this capital IJ is the reference of the Hartree-Fock state. And so what we would do, so these, if you have these Hartree-Fock states with different references, they will not necessarily be orthogonal because you'll have atomic orbitals over here and the, in one configuration, atomic orbitals over there in another configuration, and there'll be some finite, maybe small, but there'll be some finite overlap between those atomic orbitals. And that'll bleed into some overlap between your molecular orbitals. And so the overlap which we, between these reference states, which we call capital S, is now a finite number between 0 and 1. So what we then do is, so this is actually, OK, and this is a method that uh, is really very good for strong correlation. It was designed, ideally, originally to deal with strong correlation. So you then construct a generalized eigenvalue uh, equation by constructing a Hamiltonian matrix between these states here. And now we have the, uh, the overlap matrix here. So to find the energies, we have to solve this generalized eigenvalue problem rather than the, the usual eigenvalue problem when we have basis states that are orthonormal, okay, where we just diagonalize H. Now we have to diagonalize this generalized eigenvalue system. Which one can do is another. I'm not going to talk about how we do that. It's just linear, more linear algebra. So, so this is a known method, not very widely used, but it's used by my colleague Martin Head Gordon for strong static correlation. And we want to add to that dynamic correlation. So how do we do that? Well, so we have each one of our Hartree-Fock reference states here. And so, well, why don't we just add our exponential operators that we know are good at uh, capturing weak correlations of all kinds. So we'll operate on our Hartree-Fock state with an exponentially correlating operator. And of course, we like our things to be unitary, so we use our unitary couple cluster operator here. Um, but actually, in a classical case, this is all still classical. In a classical case, you cannot do it unitarily. So typically, you would use just a couple cluster doubles, and you would just take the second order term here. So classically, you would add that. And then you can perform NOCI in a subspace of such cluster functions that already contain some dynamic correlation. So that sounds OK, doable, right? So you do that. And then you run into a problem, classically. So, in, so I mentioned before that couple cluster is non-variational. But you can make it, um, I mean, you can make it sort of work properly if you use a technique called projective couple cluster. And this usually, in the, in the normal case, this truncates at exactly fourth order uh, in an expansion of the cluster operator. So this is the so-called BCH expansion of this operator here, where you've got a correlating operator here, T on the right and, and on the left, on the left and on the right. And so you, to, you can expand this by basically pulling down commutators of this. Okay, and this will truncate for, uh, for standard couple cluster at fourth order. So as a result, those projective couple cluster methods are polynomial scaling if you have an orthogonal reference. That's why 
couple cluster works uh, conventionally. But if you have non-orthogonal references, this expansion doesn't truncate because you have to take into account that overlap. And therefore, you just, it doesn't truncate at all, ever. It doesn't truncate at higher order, it just doesn't truncate. And therefore, these are computationally intractable. You cannot implement uh, NOCI if, with the inclusion of weak correlation as well. So, okay, so there you've got something that just doesn't work. But, quantum mechanically, there's something you can do. Because we noted that in quantum circuits, it's actually very easy to calculate matrix elements. And one can actually calculate a lot of these matrix elements with a single circuit. In practice, we do it with multiple circuits, but it's quite easy. It's calculating matrix elements is basically a um, question of a linear circuit. And they are efficient using standard Hamiltonian simulation methods. And the UCC states are standard. So what one can do then is one can operate, one decompose the operator into a linear combination of the Pauli strings, as we saw in the first talk, using jordan Wigner transformation. Then you decompose these uh, exponential operators with this Trotter-Suzuki decomposition to get a product of unitaries like this. Um, so then neglecting, neglecting all the non-commutation terms that may exist. Then one, on top of that, you can make additional uh, tensor decompositions to actually reduce the depth of the circuit. So this is something fairly recent uh, over the last four or five years that people have developed for um, implementing trotter uh, exponentiation or circuits with trotter exponentiation uh, for Hamiltonians that you can then further reduce the circuit depth. So this is actually quite complicated, but it, it's quite effective. And if you put all these two things together, we basically have an algorithm for computing uh, non-orthogonal states on a quantum machine. So we call that the non-orthogonal quantum eigensolver. Um, so the algorithm is as follows. We, so the input is all over here. It's the atomic coordinates, the basis, the electronic basis, the number of electrons, and so this, this, this is the capital N with the number of states. This will be little n, the number of electrons, and then the cluster ansatz that we choose. And so you can take different kinds of cluster ansatz. I'll just show you things that we did for the first instance was where we took a second order, just as in the, um, as in the, the classical slide I showed you. We take a second order terms only. And in fact, we obtain as inputs these, we take these uh, coefficients to be from a many body perturbation theory, second order classical calculation as just an input. They're readily available, so why not use them? Uh, and that's the input. And then we compute these matrix elements. So the matrix elements are now are between these states E tau for the state J, acting on J, and the state e to the tau i, acting on the state i, the Hamiltonian in between. And we also have to compute the overlap matrix elements between uh, j, between the states tau j on j and tau i on i. So we generate all of those matrix elements, and then we put those matrix elements computed by the quantum device into a classical generalized eigenvalue solver, and we get the energies from this. So because at the end we're doing classical post-processing of these uh, matrix elements, the classical post-processing gives us variational character. We don't have any gradient evaluations. We don't need to do any optimization. Well, you could do it in addition optimization. Um, and we have a classically motivated choice of ansatz. Now you might ask right here, so if you're not doing any optimization, why do you have any hope that it would be better than VQE? Well, the point is that you are now taking, rather than one Hartree-Fock reference state, you're taking multiple Hartree-Fock reference states, so you're gaining extra expressivity of your ansatz by adding these multiple reference states. And these multiple reference states can describe very different electronic configurations, so you're gaining, um, you're gaining a lot there. At a relatively small computational cost, because computing these matrix elements with two states is not 
and you go from two states to six states, it's basically just a linear uh, increase in the number in the in the amount of computational time. So, what kind of circuit do these look like? So, the circuits look like this. So, this is uh, a typical. This is a modification of what's called a Hadamard test, which is a, a standard way to evaluate um, matrix elements um, on a quantum computer. Um, I don't have a slide on it, but if you look on Wikipedia under Hadamard test, very nice example of how to do that. And you basically have to have uh, your, your state is in this register up here. So the state starts off here in the Hartree Fox state. There's an ancilla here, and you, yeah, and so you, now this first, so this one tells us what the initial state's going to be. So we create, um, we, depending what we're putting in here, we will we'll put our initial state here. Uh, for one determinant, and then we act on that determinant with the, the cluster operator, a circuit representing that cluster operator. And over here at the other end, we are going to have the cluster operator for another Hartree Fock reference state, and then this will take us back down to the vacuum state again. So these are the two, th these parts here and here represent the formation of those two different reference states. And then in between, this in the middle, is the Pauli representation of the Hamiltonian. And these two transformations, U, are designed to bring, in order to calculate that matrix element, you have to have each of these reference states in the same basis, refer to the same basis. So you have to have these uh, rotation operators here, or generalized rotation operators, which put you into the same basis. And we choose as a reference the first one. Everything is evaluated in the reference of the first basis. And then you will, um, down here on the ancilla, you will then measure um, either in the Z basis, and you make two types of measurements. You'll make measurements where this P theta is, where the theta is zero, uh, which will give us, if you go through the math, it gives you the real part of a Hamiltonian matrix elements between I and J. And if theta is pi over 2, you will get the imaginary part of a Hamiltonian matrix element between the reference states i and j. So this is the core of this algorithm. Basically, the recognition was that it's relatively easy to evaluate matrix elements on a quantum computer because of the Hadamard test. So here's a specific example. Uh, where we just input, so there's no, instead of optimization, we will input these coefficients from a perturbative second order classical quantum chemistry calculation, which gives this expression for these, where these are standard integrals and these are just the energies, uh, the hartree fock energies, and uh, we also make then a low, a low rank de decomposition of this UCD operator, which is quite complicated. Um, due to Mario Motta and co-workers at ABM. And so we applied this to H2 and H4 with these reference states, which are now unrestricted Hartree Fock, meaning that the, sorry, there's an example here. So this is H4. It's a, this is not a real molecule. This is a, um, it's a very well-known benchmark for strongly correlated systems or strongly and weakly correlated systems in quantum chemistry. It's four hydrogen atoms, so four electrons, in a square, which is a very unnatural arrangement for hydrogen. If you have hydrogen, multiple hydrogen atoms bonded together, they normally form linear chains in outer space. But these are constrained to be in a square, so that's highly constrained. Do you have a question? Yeah, just a quick, uh, maybe naive question, but when we do like a MP2 for a multi-reference system, and maybe for... for are we doing MP2 on each reference separately? Okay, okay, so you don't risk doing like having like a degeneracy that no, has the no, no, no. Okay. no, so the idea is you bring in references which are, in a sense, distinct from each other. You actually, so that actually raises an interesting point. You definitely don't want to do them together. You want uh, it here. Uh, if you have linear dependence between these states here, then you aren't going to do very well in this. Solving the generalized eigenvalue problem. So you want these states to be as distinct as possible. 
the reference states before you, t before you then do the weak correlations, and then we add the weak correlations on top. Okay. All right, so here back to the H4. So there's four electrons, and uh, there is this special point here, which is where you go from, uh, so if you're close in, you would have just paired, paired electrons, a pair here and a pair here, or a pair there and a pair there. That's where good, good solution here. That's a so-called restricted hartree fox solution as a reference where um, the electrons are paired up with opposite spin into uh, two orbitals. But outside this point here, then you need to have this unrestricted hartree fock where you have six possible configurations here. And you see each electron can be in, electrons of the same spin can be in different orbitals. So there's six here. So, so what we did was we looked at, so there are essentially four radical sites here. So this is a canonical sort of benchmark test for radical type behavior and for understanding whether a method can do well uh, with correlated systems. I mean, so you can imagine replacing each hydrogen by a manganese atom in the oxygen evolving complex, putting another one in and so on, okay, in a number of years from now. Um, so, so what we did is we looked at the bond coordinates being stretched evenly. So at this equilibrium position, you see you, you actually you're already outside this dotted line here where you need to use this unrestricted tartary fog. So it's strongly, this system, unlike the H2 molecule, this system is already strongly correlated at its equilibrium bond distance at its minimum. Uh, this is using the simplest basis. Uh, there are eight spin orbitals here. And the, these are the, this is the infinite, these are the energies, okay, on the left. So this is now in heart trees. These are chemistry units that chemists care about and like. Um, so this black line here is full configuration interaction, which you can easily do for eight spin orbitals. So that's the exact calculation within this basis set. And the red line, this is the classical NOCI, which you can also do because it's still relatively small. So you can do NOCI in this basis set. You just can't do NOCI if you went up to 100 um, radicals. I mean, not that there are systems in nature where there are 100 radicals, but if you went up to something that had eight or 10 radicals, as you might do in a biological system, this would be impossible for NOCI. No. Okay, so NOCI is here, and NOQE is actually better than NOQI, NOCI, which is also nice. It's actually very close to the FCI with these six reference states. And on the right is the, this is the infidelity of the final state. So we actually care about getting the final states, the wave functions as well. It's a wave function based method. And we want to use the output wave functions from this as input in the next generation of quantum computers, as input into a quantum phase estimation, and then get really, really exact energies. So we're already doing very well. We're already within uh, the so-called chemical accuracy uh, for most of this curve, which is chemical accuracy is about 10 to the minus 3, uh, 1.6 milli trees. So on the right is the infidelity of the wave function, the states, the ground state wave function. And this is very low. This is, so there's various plots here. I'll show you in a moment what they are. Um, so this is of the order of, at most, uh, half a percent. That's very good. And what these different curves represent, the green one, S is 1, it means we just take the MP2 coefficients straight from the classical calculation and put them in without any rescaling or anything. So that's just the agnostic, the, the so-called black box, the analog here. And the, the, the orange and the dark blue are the, uh, if we rescale, those uh, amplitudes, which is often done in classical chemistry. This is, gets, this is where classical chemistry gets quite empirical. Uh, people just find it gets better if you do some rescaling. So we do the rescaling. We also find it gets a bit better. And this is, oh, what is this one? Spin uh, bias. They rescale different components of Ah, uh, that was it, yes. OK, you scale some of them, but not all of them, right? Yeah, so each of those two, yeah. So they also do much better. But this is already the green one is very good. Yes. Why is it so bad? 
that separation? Like what is the Oh, this is this analog of the Coulson Fisher point. This is a point oh, where this is the, the four analog yeah, of the Coulson Yeah. Point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's where it's where, so before the Coulson Fisher point, you can correctly describe for the H4 as having two electrons in this, this pair of hydrogens and two electrons in that pair of hydrogens, and these would be spin paired and these would be spin fine. Right. Superposition of that and maybe this, but then they're equivalent by symmetry. Yeah. But then as they get further apart, then this pair starts to talk to this pair, right. and then everything has to be included. So that's why you're saying like the equilibrium link for H4 is it's, inside of the strongly correlated regime. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. yeah, it's outside the region. Yeah, I know it is weird. You think that it's really cool. <laughs> you tend to think that anything that is equilibrium would not be strongly correlated, that's right? Not true, yeah. Well, it's not. It's not. I mean, look at the symmetry. There are four equivalent hydrogen atoms here. So why would there be a tendency for? Right. Although you could actually say, why is there even when they're closer? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting system for correlation. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can make also people make. Um, I've seen hydrogen chains a lot. Hydrogen chains, yes, but they are also strongly correlated. Yes, they are, but this is maybe a more stringent yeah. requirement. There's another system that another student Megara has been working on, which is hydrogen six octahedral hydrogen six. Doesn't exist, yeah. but that's very very highly strained. Yeah. Yeah. I know Mata has produced papers of like hydrogen chains, like really. Yeah, hydrogen, hydrogen chains. Hydrogen, hydrogen chains are quite common. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we've done hydrogen chains in the past as well. So we developed a variational version of this first, and we use that to look at hydrogen chains. Did we? Uh, we certainly we have maybe that one or another paper. Um, all right. So, so that's nice. This is actually very encouraging. I mean, this is actually for a wave function method. This is actually pretty good. Half of percent. Okay. And now about the scalings. Well. So we looked at the, um, you know, for, for the computational complexity, we looked at the asymptotic scaling that you would need. So how do these counts of the circuits, how do they depend upon the number of uh, spin orbitals? And on the now, we have a new parameter, which is the number of non-orthogonal reference states, M. So we had six for the H4. And then there's another parameter here, which is this decomposition of those cluster operators, which is, it basically says you've got your Hamiltonian, uh, decomposition or your, in our case it was the cluster, uh, uh, no this is for the Hamiltonian decomposition. So the, class, the Hamiltonian has at most n squared terms, but by making this uh, tensor decomposition you can reduce that to a number L terms, which can be considerably less than n squared. So the, com the total complexity for the off-diagonal matrix elements is of, goes quadratically, in the number of reference states, uh, and it goes linear, uh, linearly in L, the Takagi decomposition, and it goes quadratically in the basis. I forget what the K is. So, so these are the number, these are the gate counts. So we compare this with classical couple cluster. So those pro, uh, for, for radical sites, they would scale as n to the d plus 4. So that's definitely exponential for d radical sites, whereas our dependence on the basis is n squared, and the number of radicals is m squared too. So how about the number of radical sites d? Okay, so m, m is the orthogonal reference sites. So how does m square, scale with the number of radical sites? Well, m actually scales exponentially with the number of radical sites, so that's not good. But remember that these are radical sites. This is where the domain-specific uh, constraints come in. There are no molecules that have, large molecules that have, you know, everything being a radical. Okay, so the most, even in biological systems, the most number of radical sites you might imagine having to deal with would probably be 10 at most. So this, so this, bound, this uh, scaling is, is exact scaling uh, if you can't compute you know, how does the number of configurations scale with the number of radical sites? But you would never be anywhere, you'd, you'd be capped at very, very small values here. So, and as I mentioned before, the uh, classical NOCI cannot deal with this at all, so it's not even here because it just doesn't, um, it's just not there, uh, it's intractable. Oh, sorry, let me turn that off. I forgot to 
turn the volume off. Okay. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. So, all right, so what's the closest classical approach? So I mentioned earlier that there is one uh, not direct analog, but the closest possible classical approach is CAS SP2, uh, CAS PT2, or something like that. There's something called NEVT2, which is similar. And so here, the relevant um, analog of this M would be the number of states in the selected subspace. And this scales as order d factorial squared. So that's another exponential. So technically, we have an exponential reduction over the best classical method, although we are still exponential. But uh, there are other ways, actually, why. So even though, so even not if we're standing this, I mean, because they would also not be using more than 10 here, um, that 10 would make a big difference, actually, to have a double exponential of 10. Um, and, and also other factors in the CAS SP2 are more expensive. So, yeah, so that's the scaling. So based on this, oh, so one more thing. Uh, before I go to the, the wrap up here. Um, so we also looked at the, uh, an empirical estimation just to see what are the prefactors here. So if you talk to a classical quantum chemist, they say, well, this asymptotic scaling is very nice, but, but what's the prefactors in front? You know, if I have to do 10,000 operations in front, then I'm not really interested, you know, even if I only have quadratic scaling uh, with, with n. So, so we, we did the test of um, some systems. Uh, OK, so I don't have the plot for what systems these were. But they were something involving different numbers of radical sites, two, four, six, and with different truncations of this um, Hamiltonian uh, and the, also the, um, the exponential uh, correlation operator. So these truncations can be very low. And that's actually what one thing this figure illustrates, that you could actually have uh, in one case, we, had, um, trun we made a truncation of 0 0.04, just 4% of n squared. And in another case, we made the full, we did the calculation with the full uh, estimate. And then the, the gate count isn't that different. Okay, even though one has a big difference here, so here there'll be no, with n squared, the dotted lines are with no eigenvalue truncation. You only have a relatively mild increase. It's about one order of magnitude increase in the gate count as um, if you were to not make that eigenvalue truncation. And in particular, we see that as the number of radical sites increases between the green line, the red line, and the blue line here, there's really only a relatively small increase, mild increase in the number of gates. So that's, that's good. Um, already with two sites, uh, so we saw with H2, I haven't shown you that, but it's in the paper. With two sites, we can certainly describe the strong static correlation that's involved if you break any single bond. And so we expect this is relevant to systems like uh, twisted, uh, twisted um, multiple bond systems and, for instance, something like this, which would be a dicopper molecule. So, it seems that this approach, this non-orthogonal approach, that's the key, to use this non-orthogonal approach and the ease of quantum uh, circuits in evaluating off-diagonal matrix elements. With this, as long as things improve with respect to the noise, uh, this approach is well positioned to target the relative spin state, state energetics of, eventually, the polynuclear transition metal clusters in metalloenzymes and molecular magnets. And this, this is not within the next couple of years, but it's definitely a, uh, a well-posed and well-validated um, goal for this approach. So let me now sum up with quantum advantage. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time here. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, quantum advantage for quantum chemistry. So that was, you know, so why, why are we doing all of this? So despite the fact that, that there are uh, empirical es es uh, evidence that a single reference calculation cannot really benefit from quantum computing, uh, we've identified a system where you can see a strong benefit 
which is the systems which have strong and weak correlation together. So this approach where you do the core part of the calculation is the evaluation of matrix elements of the Hamiltonian and of the, of, and of the uh, overlap matrix. The core part is evaluated on a quantum processor, and then you do pre-processing afterwards on a classical machine to generate um, eigenvalues and eigenstates. So we get these high-quality wave functions as a result of that, which will be superpositions of multi uh, of different reference states with coherent superpositions of different reference states. They can be input into a quantum phase estimator to get even more accurate energies. With the benefit is with relatively low circuit depths because these circuit depths were all developed for these different reference states, and all you're doing the, with that circuit is to generate the an ansatz with a correlated um, which, which puts weak correlation on top of a single reference and then you rely on the generalized eigenvalue solver to do all the rest of the work to find the right linear combination of those that gives you the lowest energy so you can do that with relatively low circuits in our approach we have definitely relied on input from classical chemistry methods. And I think going forward, we'll continue to do that because it's there. They have a huge amount of valuable information. Why, why make it harder for yourself? Why not use it? Uh, why step on uh, successful approaches and to go to the next step? There's no variation optimization required here. Um, instead of that, we're using some input from classical chemistry methods to think what is the right thing to do or to put in here at any given time. But you, uh, we could also make these things variational. Uh, as I mentioned before, we started off doing a variational approach before we um, realized that we don't need to. Uh, and yeah, the gate complexity here is, goes as n squared, so it's very nice. Uh, there's also a, a comment here. One can, so the, the gate complexity will depend on the complexity here, L, of the cluster operator. And I talked about the cluster operator being UCC with MP2, uh, ANSATSA for this. Uh, we've also looked at more agnostic types of cluster operators, in particular JASTRO operator, which uh, Nikolai here has been working on. Um, that's also very promising. And yeah, so the bottom line is that we have an algorithmic quantum, we've identified a system in quantum chemistry where there is indeed an algorithmic quantum advantage in the sense that the classical analog of the approach is completely intractable, and the best possible classical method for getting the same kind of results has uh, exponentially more, uh, it scales exponentially worse. So there is an exponential gap. And then the last thing is that we realize that there's also a practical quantum advantage. This is not something that's quantified by um, asymptotic complexities, but this is both, this approach is both variational and size consistent and also size extensive. And this is actually not the case for most classical methods. The only methods that are both variational and size consistent are Hartree-Fock, which is too simple and not, not accurate enough, and full configuration interaction, which is intractable for anything other than a small system. So there is, from a chemistry perspective, a practical quantum advantage here that we have that the method uh, combines these two highly desirable features, which are usually not met together in any one method. So that's, I think the next slide is more or less the same kind of thing here. Ah, so a bit of a caveat, that's another summary here, but the general framework that can be modified by choosing different reference states, and also by the cluster operator. And one small caveat is we don't have any guarantees that on the eigenvalue, eigenenergy errors here. So you have to benchmark it as always. So unless we put, take the output state and put that into a quantum phase estimator, then we would have some guarantees, judging by what the, taking the overlap, and then we would have some guarantees of what, what the energies would be, which is a long-term goal. Okay, that's it. In the guarantees, how do you check the results? Well, right now we're doing small calculations where we can do FCI. Yeah, so that's, that's what you do. Until you can no longer do FCI, 
but then you have, hopefully by then, you have enough experience and guarantees that, oh, not, not hard guarantees, but you have enough experience that you know which direction to go in. And then you're out on your own. Then you have to go out, but then you do what all ex quantum chemists do, and you compare with experiment. But then the experiment's not accurate enough normally. So, I mean, we're, we're going for energies here which probably will be more ac accurate than experiments can measure. Yep. Um, it might be a naive question from an experimentalist side. Um, no, no questions too naive. I'm, this is very interdisciplinary I'm curious, field. Uh, like, um, so I can see like the NLQE are um, focusing on the strong and also the weak correlation. That's really cool. Um, but like at the beginning, they are using the Hartree-Fock sets. It's from classical um, computation, and like we are using um, multiple references. I was thinking, like, for a larger system, if we use the classical input, I feel like it still, like, costs a lot. I don't know if it's true. So, what do you mean it costs a lot? Um, like, like, for BQE, what are the disadvantages? They are using the classical input as the trial wave function. Um, here, we still use the classical results as the input. I don't know, like, if we're, I, I feel like if we are calculating the um, hydrogen, like, four hydrogen, it works pretty well. But I don't know if we are calculating, like, larger molecules, we're still using that. So, yeah. so in this case, actually, the input's a bit deceptive. The input is... The input is actually is actually a superposition of these, so it's no longer completely classical. So you have individual references built on Hartree Fox, each one of these, you know, but then you're putting them together, and the next time, so your 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 assumption in making this equation is that your solution is a linear combination of these. Yes, but if we want to calculate like the I, JK, we need to like run the classical cal like calculation multiple times, right? You know? It's a hard to focus on the number of radicals is fixed. Like it's not a lot. What what is the problem? Oh, I, I just feel like if we want to calculate the I and J and K, we need to like run calculation one, two, three, three times, and then like. If we want to have multiple so, references, would you run the calculation multiple times? No. So we, we construct, we use classical solutions to generate the states i, j, and k. Uh -huh. Then we add the cluster operators. We then evaluate these cluster operators quantumly on the states. At that point, we have a quantum state. Uh -huh. And then we compute, the, again, with the uh, quantum processor, we compute the the matrix element of that quantum state, of, of, of the Hamiltonian operator between this quantum state and the other quantum state. Yeah, yeah. So, what else do you want to make quantum? Oh, I mean, like to calculate the Hartree-Fock reference state. You could do that, but it's so easy to do classically. Why bother? Uh, you, you want to, the quantum resource is, is, is expensive and it's valuable. You want to save your strategy is generally to use the quantum resource to do the thing that's the hardest, that you, the thing that you cannot do classically. But everything that you can do classically, well, let's just do it classically. Because it's much harder to operate a quantum computer than a classical computer. So let's just run the, everything we can do classically, we'll just run that quickly on our laptops. And then we can spend a week fixing the parameters in the circuit so that we can actually compute the off diagonal matrix elements like this. Yeah. So it's a question of strategy. Yeah. yeah. And th it's the same in all quantum algorithms. I mean, Peter, if you look at Schwarz algorithm, there's a lot of classical post-processing and pre-processing. And the, the essential quantum part is the part that's really hard, which is finding the period, which was done with a quantum Fourier transform. So there's nothing wrong with you combining classical processing with quantum processing. The secret is to, 
figure out where to invest the valuable quantum resource to solve the really hard problem. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my first question will be, um, are you able to do excited states with no? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, so. Um, oh, the other way. So the, yeah, so we have in the paper, we have multiple excited states. Yeah, they, they just come out automatically because when you solve the generalized eigenvalue problem with six reference states, you'll get six energies. And like the first few of them are, are quite accurate. Yeah. In fact, we can also do things to optimize for specific ones. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then my second question would be, as you said before, you know, doing Hubble cluster classically implementing like multi-reference, it will be classically intractable. It's intractable. It's because you have non-terminating basically. Yes. Yeah, yes. so that's a one clear advantage of yes. quantum computation because you, just, you can just do it. Yes. Um, so is your, because that's like what we, what we do in the group as well. So I'm, I was just wondering, is there any another direction of where uh, like there is a very clear quantum advantage. So that, that is the algorithmic quantum advantage, right. which is sort of the generically, the, the advantage that everyone is looking for to yeah. justify building quantum machines. Yeah. But for quantum chemistry, whoops, what happened here? Oh, I, I didn't, I got a couple more slides. Um, there's, in for quantum chemistry, there's also this feature that this approach for solving the electronic structure problem is variational and it's also size consistent, which means that if I take a, a system, say, of, of two hydrogen molecules and pull them apart, I will always get the true ground state energy as I, if I solve it exactly. Whereas if many other methods, um, if you pull them apart, in between you'll get basis set errors, superpositions, and you, you will not get the right energies. So typically in quantum chemistry, you either have good variational character or you have size consistency. You don't have both together. So this is a, a, a true, this is a very quantum chemistry specific advantage and it's very practical. Let me just see what else I had here. Oh, next steps. Oh yeah, so this was actually useful to say. Classically difficult problems, we estimated this correspond to like eight unpaired spins, like metal radicals. And that, that's about 70 by 70. 70, 70 reference states. That would be very hard for a classical computer. Um, not so hard. If your quantum computer was working without errors, it wouldn't be so hard because you just have 70 times the number of matrix elements to evaluate. Okay, right. I think that's the last thing. Oh, this was, a, this was one very last thing. So this is something that we've talked about in, to possibly build models for larger chemical systems so like this is the kind of thing which we really are interested in. But actually there's this very interesting work here that suggests where they calculated energy levels uh, using density functional theory for this system and also that here's the experiment. But they took a little hydrogen four model, H4 linear chain. So linear hydrogen four and like it's simulating basically <coughs> this, this ion, this nickel, this nickel and that ion replacing them. So you might say, well, that sounds crazy, but they get the right energy ordering of these states. The energies themselves aren't too accurate, but they're not that bad, the lowest ones. In particular, this triplet state here, it's pretty good for such a model. So this is the kind of thing you could also think about doing with this approach. That's it. Yes. I have a, bro, I have a question. Like, what happens for the generalized eigenvalue problem that you have there, yes. that HS equals, what happens if the S matrix, if I don't recall wrong, is single? Yes, what that's bad. Yeah, that's so very bad. How do you, you? So this is where chemical intuition again comes in. You want to make sure that your the the reference states that you put in are not are linearly independent. Oh, so that's very important, and then. Even if they're partially linearly independent, there's some overlap, you still have to be careful. So we actually look very carefully at the condition number of that S matrix, and we're still actively working actually on sort of automating that part of it. But yeah, we do have a problem if, it, if they're linearly dependent. Maybe I understand wrong. So you basically said like the, uh, you have like a term that it, it does not tr truncate, right? Like you have- This was in the- Yeah. Uh, like in the classical case. 
This one. This one, yeah. Yeah, this expansion. Yeah. In the quantum one, it does not truncate, right? No, it, it depends what uh, it depends what what you're putting here in this cluster operator. Okay, so if this cl cluster operator is the usual couple cluster operator, then this truncates at fourth order. If, however, you're using um, that, but you need to have a, a projective. Or basically, you need to be working in an orthogonal basis for that. If you have a non-orthogonal basis, then this series doesn't truncate. You, you don't. You can't do it. You're nothing. It's intract, intractable. Means that you know you go home and you do something different. <laughs> yes. So that's that's a win for us. <laughs> yeah. Then you use cast sp two. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I'm wondering how long it takes for the quantum computation to run, and if we are limited by the coherence time of the existing qubits. Oh, that's definitely true. Yes. So how long does it take to run this qubit? Oh, we haven't done this one yet on a quantum computer. Oh. We're, we're working with a company to do that, but we haven't actually implemented it. I see. But we have something like uh, 40 or 50 gate counts for H2. Yeah, so we think it can be done. We're gearing up to do it, but it takes a long time to do these things. Yeah, it takes a very long time to do these things. So everything you can do classically. If you really need an answer, do it classically. <laughs> do it. So. Yes. So, uh, question. Oh, that, a, 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 let me ask him. Uh, yeah, you, you ask. Well, yeah. Uh, am I learning that the, uh, the key aspect for the quantum advantage here is the ability to compute matrix elements better? In, in this case, yeah, yes. This case. yes. And you, if, if, I, if that is true, do people think of doing having quantum advantage on like quantum dynamics where they have to compute matrix elements to compute rates and everything? You could, yeah, you could do the same if you want to compute your rates by matrix elements. But there are many ways to compute rates. A lot of people in chemical dynamics want to compute rates by following systems in time and calculating correlation, time-dependent correlation functions. And so there's many ways, yes. But yeah, that would be one way, yes, if you can compute matrix elements efficiently, as long as it's a finite number. If you're expanding something as a sum over states, then you, would have to, then you may not want to do that. Then you might prefer to do the time-dependent manner. Right, so then you have yeah, And uh, do you evaluate, evaluate the matrix element like uh, one by one to write down the full Hamiltonian or the overlap matrix, or do you do, uh, just do this way by iterative way, like in the Davidson method? Also? No, we. I mean, so what about we've done? We've just written down explicitly. But not explicitly, and so is it uh, approxim uh, approximated the one by the uh, quantum? Uh, quantum algorithm, so that they might have some error, or they are just calculated maybe explicitly uh, or precisely just what you write down. It's what I wrote down. So I'm not sure what. I mean you that uh, is there any uh, maybe like error or the approximations uh, about uh, every matrix element you write? Oh, so actually one important feature is, I'm not, I don't think this is what you're saying, but there is an important feature, is that we are measuring our matrix elements by measuring the output of a quantum circuit. Okay. And so that means that there's measurement noise. So, so we there do, will be the noise, but the error is yes. controllable maybe by... So uh, far, uh, yes. If you measure enough times, then you can get... But we're finding that actually there's more noise on the excited states than on the ground state, yeah. which is interesting. But uh, yes, you do have to be, you have to worry about that a bit. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, maybe, uh, like how many, uh, maybe the condition numbers of the overlap, overlap metrics may be since you are the non orthogonal method, yeah. Because I also suffered in my own research about that. <laughs> like, so, uh, condition numbers or the, uh, um, like you'll be having of the uh, overlap metrics. Yes. Mm, so yes, you do have to worry about that, yes. You, yeah. yeah. So the, maybe the only way to do it is to like uh, adding the precision by uh, evaluating the. Well, I think the the primary thing is to choose the reference states so that that's not the key factor, so that you're far from the the, the condition number is well defined and that you can tolerate some noise on it. Okay. Yeah. So just in the wave function, just in the step of wave function and start, so we try something that. Uh, uh, decrease the like make them as orthogonal as possible. Yeah. Well, you you could yes you could try to look at the wave functions themselves, but but actually choosing the different reference state is actually is generically some way to do that. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you okay. okay. So let's thank Brigitte.